I want to invite you to turn to our GPS, our Grow, Pray, Study Guide, which is in the back of your worship program. See a section there for taking notes, any uh, thing you may want to remember from today's message. And beneath that is the study guide, which is an invitation for you to read the Bible each day this week with scripture passages that tie into today's message. So I hope that you will take this with you and utilize it during the week. Uh, as most of you know, uh, my wife Cindy and I have two sons. We have Micah, who is 11, and Daniel, who's 9. And about three years ago or so, uh, I asked them, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And Daniel spoke up right away. And Daniel mentioned three things. Daniel said, I want to be a soccer player, which we were expecting. Uh, I want to be an artist, which we were also expecting. He was into art at the time. And then he said this, and I want to be a pastor because I love God. Now, when Cindy and I heard that, we were blown away. We realized God is at work in Daniel's life. God is reaching out to Daniel even as a six-year-old. What we saw in that moment was a glimpse of God's grace. Today, we're starting a new series called Growing in Grace. And my hope for this series is that we will come to understand and experience God's grace as described in the Methodist or Wesleyan tradition. Some of us grew up in the Methodist church. Others of us didn't. And every now and then, someone will come up to me and, and ask, you know, what's unique about the Methodist church? Uh, what do Methodists believe? And, and I think that uh, if there's one word that captures the heart of Methodist theology, it is grace. So we're going to spend the next four weeks exploring and unpacking God's amazing grace. The word grace comes from the Greek word charis, which means gift. And its root meaning, therefore, grace is gift. It's something we don't earn, something we don't deserve, but something God gives us as a gift. Now, they say that Eskimos have a bunch of different words for snow because snow is so important to them. Well, in the same way, Christians have many different ways of describing God's grace. It's one grace with different aspects, different facets. John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church, and he describes grace in three different ways that relate to three different stages of our spiritual journey. Now, these three aspects or stages of grace provide the structure of this series, and they are prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. Grace is how God works in our lives. And these three together, provenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, they tell the story from beginning to end of how God works in our lives in order to save us. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save the lost. God's desire is to save us. And we can think of God's salvation as a story with three chapters. Chapter 1 is prevenient grace. Chapter 2 is justifying grace. Chapter 3 is sanctifying grace. And my hope is that by the end of this series, everyone in our church will be able to name and explain these three chapters of grace. And I might, we might have a final, okay? We might have a fill in the blank. Name the three. Okay. You got three. Okay. You got four weeks to learn this. Right, we're going to have a test. Okay. You got four weeks to learn these three. See, my hope is that each of us will be able to name and explain these three facets of grace. That by the end of this series, 
You could sit down with a friend and say, let me tell you about grace, the Methodist understanding of grace. It's a beautiful story. And it all begins with a word you've never heard before, prevenient. Prevenient grace is the first chapter. So prevenient grace is the subject of today's sermon. And I guarantee you that you have never heard the word prevenient on Sports Center. Amen? How many of you have never heard the word prevenient before? Raise those hands. That's right. Yes. I've never heard the word prevenient outside of discussions of Methodist theology. It's just not a word that comes up at work. But you might try it this week. Just throw it into one of your work conversations. The term prevenient comes from the Latin word prevenir, which means to come before. So in Wesleyan theology, it means the grace that comes before any human decision or endeavor. Prevenient grace is at work, at work in our lives before we are even aware of it. Prevenient, prevenient grace means God is present with us throughout our lives, reaching out to us. It is the love of God wooing us like a groom courting his bride. It is the will of God drawing us to God's self. Prevenient grace is the, the desire of God pursuing us throughout our lives in order to bring us into a friendship with God, to bring us into a relationship with God. The verse that for me best captures the essence of prevenient grace is a verse that we looked at this morning, 1 John 4, 19. We love because God first loved us. God first loves us and reaches out to us. That is prevenient grace. Here's a summary of how John Wesley described prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is that grace through which we are initially drawn to our Heavenly Father. It inspires in us a desire for a relationship with God, and if we yield to it, increases more and more the light of the Son of God in our hearts. Prevenient grace actually enlightens every human being to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. In fact, all the holy and righteous convictions that emerge in hearts of human beings are made possible by the Holy Spirit through prevenient grace. See, Wesley understood that all people are capable of doing good things. All people are capable of, of saying, wait, this isn't right. Let's do this instead. What we might normally call conscience, these different aspects. Wesley understood that all people are capable of that. But for in Wesley's eyes, that's all grace. That's prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is God making the first move to us. And here's why that's so key in Wesleyan theology, because on our own, we're stuck. On our own, apart from God's grace, we can't make the first move to God. On our own, we are spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.5 says that Jesus Christ came to make us alive while we were dead in our trespasses and sins. According to Scripture, apart from God's grace, each and every one of us is spiritually dead and, and totally void of any ability to save ourselves. Now, in Wesley's day, that was more or less a given. But in our day, I think for most of us, that sounds kind of strange. We don't talk a lot about sin, and we don't necessarily see ourselves as sinful. We know we have areas where we could improve. We know that we may do things that aren't right every now and then, like cheat on our taxes or steal some pins from the office. But besides that, we don't see sin as a, a really big deal. But in Wesleyan theology, sin is a really big deal because sin isn't just about doing specific actions. The reality of sin in our world and in our lives means that apart from God's grace, we are spiritually dead and have no capacity to respond to or connect to God. The reality of sin is that we are cut off from God 
And, and on our own, there's nothing we can do about that. You know, sometimes as a parent, I want to think, if I just do a good enough job parenting, my children won't need to be saved. But Scripture says, <laughs> nope, that's just not true. Each and every one of us needs to be saved because each and every one of us is stuck in our sin apart from God's grace. We're dead. We're asleep without God's grace. I know that's not how we see ourselves for many of us, but, but that's how Scripture describes our spiritual condition apart from God's grace. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And as strange as it may seem, that is all of us. We're spiritually dead, so God has to make the first move. Those in the Reformed tradition, following the lead of John Calvin, would say that God makes the first move by choosing or electing whom God will save. Only those who are elect will be saved. That's the Reformed doctrine of predestination. God has chosen in advance, predestined, who will be saved, and only those who are predestined are brought out of spiritual death and into spiritual life. Now, this doctrine of predestination was very popular in Wesley's day. And in fact, it's still quite popular today. Just a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with someone right in the back of our sanctuary who is, strongly believes in predestination. So this doctrine basically says everyone is spiritually asleep and God chooses whom God will wake up. Wesley rejected this doctrine of predestination. Wesley said, yes, everyone is spiritually asleep, but God wants to wake up everyone. And prevenient grace is God's alarm clock. Provenient grace is God reaching out to everyone, everyone saying, wake up, wake up, arise. Now, when speaking about provenient grace, Wesley's favorite verse was John 1, 9. We find these words in John 1, 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light that gives light to whom? Everyone. Wesley took that word very seriously. Everyone. To everyone. In Jesus Christ, God's light shines out to everyone, not just the elect, but everyone. Everyone in Kailua. Everyone in Kanioe. Everyone in Waimanalo. Everyone in Eva Beach. Everyone in Los Angeles. Everyone in Houston. Everyone in Mexico City. Everyone in Sultan's Battery, India. Everyone in China and Iceland and Uganda. Everyone. God is reaching out to everyone. God's light is shining into the hearts of everyone in order to wake us up, in order to make us alive, in order to save us. God takes the initiative to seek us. God takes the initiative to reconcile us. God calls out to us, come home. That's prevenient grace. Grace that comes before we ask for it. Grace that comes before we realize we need it. Grace that comes before we realize we've received it. That's prevenient grace. Most of the time, we're not even aware of this grace until we look back. When we look back on our lives, we realize that was God's grace. That was God pursuing me. That was God nudging me. That was God stirring me. That was God reaching out to me. How do we experience God's prevenient grace? First and foremost, through the Holy Spirit. 
through the Holy Spirit convicting us, which as Wesley describes, for most of us is simply experienced as our, even our conscience convicting us. Our conscience saying, what are you doing? This isn't right. Turn around. I know when my wife Cindy went off to college, I told her last night, I'm going to talk about you today. Uh, but when, when my wife Cindy went off to college, she wanted nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the church. She'd had a negative experience growing up in church. So she said, I'm in college in LA. Woohoo! My parents are back in Chicago. Bye, church. Bye, God. She, we lived in the same dorm her freshman year. It was my sophomore year. She was just partying away. She has a very specific memory being in the dorm bathroom, having had too much to drink, feeling sick, oh, just sitting there, and God kind of saying, so how's it going? <laughs> right? Is this really the good life? Is this really what you want out of life? And Cindy was like, no, it's not. And that moment could have been just a, a five-second Ding! That turned her to say, I am going to check out the Bible study here. I am going to check out Christian fellowship. And God used that to draw Cindy to God's heart and to a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit moves. That's how God moves in, the, in, in provenient grace. And God moves through the Holy Spirit through people a lot of the time. I know our youth director, Al, is not here, but one, for me, one of the privileges, we, we were there Tuesday through Saturday, we were in a 15-person van, like that big old white van, and we were all together, 11 of us, and so Al was always driving, and I was always in the passenger seat, so we had lots of conversation, and um, for me, it was really great to hear how God has worked in Al's life, and I'm, he's definitely going to come and share that, so I don't want to share too much, but at one point, Al and his wife, Colleen, their family were living in Connecticut, and Al didn't want anything to do with God or the church. He thought Christians were a bunch of hypocrites. Wanted nothing to do with them. But when they moved to Connecticut, there was a neighbor who welcomed them. And um, this neighbor brought a bunt cake over. And Al was like, do people really do that? Like, I thought only in movies people, like, bring a cake over to a neighbor. Like, he just never had a neighbor do that before. And he got to know this neighbor. He was just a really nice guy. And after a while of just knowing him, this neighbor invited them to church. And Al knew him, Al liked him, Al trusted him. And so Al said to Colleen, let's go to church. And through that one invitation, God worked in Al's life to bring Al into relationship with God, where, where Al gave his life to Christ. And that came through one neighbor inviting him to church. Al can look back now and say, that's provenient grace. That was God reaching out to me through that person. See, and that means that we as a church can be a channel of God's provenient grace. I saw a beautiful example of this a few months ago. I know Pastor Samuel, Pastor Babs are here, but we had a meeting at the Beacon of Hope House. That's a ministry, right, um, of our church for women coming out of the correctional facility, out of the prison here in Kailua, for women coming out of that transitioning. And it's a home for them. And so we had a meeting, but the residents were there, and they began sharing about their Wednesday night Bible study fellowship time, where they talk story, where they study scripture, where they pray, where they encourage each other. And there were women living there that said, this is the first time I've ever experienced a home. And there were women there that were saying, you know, what I have experienced here is God inviting me into a new start, God giving me a new start in life. And I remember thinking, this is provenient grace. God is reaching out to these women coming out of prison through our church, through our ministry of the Beacon of Hope House. It was beautiful to hear their sharing. Provenient grace means that God is reaching out to everyone, everyone, including you. In fact, God, in his provenient grace, may be reaching out to you right now. God may be speaking out to you this morning. This sermon may be your provenient grace of God. God saying to you, come home. So no matter where you are, no matter where you've run, no matter what you've done, God wants a relationship with you. God is reaching out to you saying, come, come, follow me. Come receive my love. 
Come, give your life to me that you may live. As a hymn in our hymnal puts it, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me, come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Have you heard Jesus' call? Have you accepted Jesus' invitation? Have you said yes to God's prevenient grace? Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your grace that reaches out to us wherever we are, that reaches out to us for the first time or the thousandth time, that reaches out to us if this is the first time in a church or the thousandth time in worship, that your grace reaches out to us and that in any way we have wandered from you, you invite us to come home. You speak to us, you speak to me, come home, all is forgiven. Thank you for your prevenient grace. God, we acknowledge that without it, we are stuck. And I invite you just this morning to respond to God. Just a moment of silence to respond to God, however you would like to, whatever you want to say, to God in this moment. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you that it reaches out to us. I think it's uh, appropriate, God, that we were able to baptize Chloe this morning. For we see your prevenient grace, even as infants, even in baptism, even as children through Sunday school, even as youth with the youth mission trips, even in college, even in <laughs> midlife, even to our 80s and our 90s and up. We know that you are a God who reaches out to us and invites us to come home to you. And we thank you for that. And God, it is because you are a God of grace that we come to you with our prayers, with our requests, with our needs, both for ourselves, our family, our church, and for our state and our nation and our world. God, you know that it's been a, a tumultuous week in our country. And God, we have uh, some prayer requests here. We, we want to pray for comfort for the family and friends of the police officers that were killed and wounded in Dallas. God, we pray for um, just each of them that's been affected. And we, we, we pray for Dallas. And God, we also just pray for our nation. And God, we pray for those persons of color who've died as a result of police misconduct. God, we pray for healing um, in our nation and for justice. And um, God, we cry out to you for your grace in these settings across our nation. We also have a prayer request, God, just for reconciliation among our divisions in our country. God, pour out your grace. God, we want to thank you, prayer request to thank you for, for the Beacon of Hope House uh, as it begins its fourth year. And uh, we pray for the women there. We pray for the women not yet there. We pray for this ministry that we would continue to be a channel of your grace to those who come and live there. God, we pray for for Jean Ann Kohler's uh, return from Louisiana, uh, return to Louisiana, God. We just ask you to bless her as she goes back there, go before her and guide her. And God, we want to pray for Noni uh, Kazi, who's hospitalized in Anchorage, Alaska. 
And we pray for, for Noni, God, just for her healing and your blessing upon her. God, you know the, the unwritten, unspoken prayers in our heart as well. God, we look to you for your grace at work in our lives and in our world. And we offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.